Church, we're continuing in our sermon series entitled Living by the Spirit, and it's, it's um, the fourth week here. We're, we're going to be talking, I'm sorry, it's entitled A Way Out, and today we're going to talk about living in the Spirit. You know, there are many people who are sitting here right now who you have a reoccurring temptation in your life. You know what I'm talking about? That, that no matter what you do, you can't seem to get rid of that temptation. No matter how you, you work hard at it, you still struggle with it. What Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 tells us is, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Church, that's what it's about right there. You know, as we, we're talking about a way out in our struggles and temptation, I want you to remember what Paul told us in 1 Corinthians. We've been talking about this this whole month. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 and 14, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Church, God will always give you that way out. You know, I pray today that each and every one of you are encouraged by this truth. And and no matter what you're facing, seriously, because we're all going through something, aren't we? No matter what it is that you're facing, you'll realize that there's always a way out. See, we're tempted by a lot in today's world, aren't we? I mean, it seems to be around every corner. Yeah, how many of you this morning are, are are tempted to complain? I mean, you just complain about everything. You're always complaining, and I want you to know there's a way out for that. How many of you this morning are tempted to compare? Comparing yourselves to others. I'm talking about you're dissatisfied. You are envying other people. You're jealous. You're jealous of what other people have. I want you to know, church, there's a way out. You may be tempted to overspend. There's always a way out. You may be tempted to worry. I mean, you're always worrying about something. Church, there's a way out. Maybe you got an addiction. It could be gambling. It could be social media. It could be that you're smoking something, drinking something. Church, there's always a way out. Maybe you're looking at something inappropriate. You know that God is completely convicting you of the things that you're turning your eyes towards. I want you to know there's always a way out, whatever it is. Listen, our God is faithful. He will always let you not be tempted beyond what you can bear. So the challenge is this, church. The challenge is this. Often we think, all right, I don't want to do this anymore. How many of you guys have drawn that line in the sand with whatever your struggle is? And you're like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm done. I I, I don't want to do this anymore. I I I don't want to think about these things. You know, a lot of times what we do is we think, I, I got to stop thinking about this. And then if I stop thinking about this, then I won't do that wrong thing. And, and I need to stop focusing on those wrong things. But actually what happens is when you sit there and tell yourself, I'm not going to think about it anymore. Typically what happens is you think about it. <laughs> See, Scripture actually teaches us that there is one plan of attack when it comes to this. It's good, of course, not to think about the wrong things, but instead the Bible tells us that we are to focus on the good things. You turn your focus on the God's Word and see, we, we are focused not just thinking about the wrong things, but we're focused on what it is that God calls us to focus on. And so when someone tells you don't think about it, you instantly do. Today, what I want to do in this sermon series is we're talking about the Holy Spirit. I want to go a little bit deeper, and I want to share with you a very powerful scripture today. It comes from Galatians chapter 5. If you want to turn there with me, in in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says this. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Church, what are the desires of the flesh, right? We've talked about this every single week. What are the desires of the flesh? You know, in the Bible, the flesh is the picture of our sinful nature, right? That's what the desires of the flesh is, the things that you know are wrong that we are drawn towards. And if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you'll recognize that you've actually got a war going on. 
I mean, you do. You are in a major battle. You're struggling so hard. It's between God's spirit and, and what he wants you to do and what your sinful nature wants to do. It's this constant pulling and, and just butting against each other's heads. And, and But the Bible says if we walk by the spirit, you would not do what your sinful nature craves. And if you walk by the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And if you walk by the spirit, you will not be tempted to do the wrong thing and give into that temptation. But verse 17 says this. It says the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of the sinful nature. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. I believe almost all of us can relate to that verse right there. Seriously, we can all relate to that. And, and we're, we're like what the Apostle Paul mentions in Romans chapter 7, right? Paul said this, and I'm, 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 I'm going to just give you the gist of it, the paraphrase of it. Paul said this, he says, I don't get it. The things that I want to do, I just don't do it. In church, we're like that, don't we? And he says, the things that I don't want to do, I always end up doing. You know, how many of you would say that you can relate to that this morning? You can actually relate to what Paul was saying there. You, you want to do what's right, but you just don't. How many of you have made that statement like, you know, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to read my Bible every single day, right? And, and you go through it and you start reading it and all of a sudden day one, yeah, I did it great. Day two, you're doing great. Day three, you're still in God's word. And then on day number four, you stop. You stop. You just quit reading and something gets busy, whatever it might be, right? We stop in those things. How many of you say, man, I want to get in shape. I'm going to start jogging. I mean, I'm going to get up out of this chair. I'm going to start jogging, right? And then all of a sudden, you see there's a 10% chance of rain, and I don't, I don't want to get my new shoes wet, so I'll just do it another day. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You know, I, I want to do the thing, the right things, and I don't want to do the wrong things. Maybe you're thinking, you know what, I don't want to sleep with my boyfriend or girlfriend because that goes against what God words, God's word tells us. And then all of a sudden it happens again. You know, I don't want to do these things, but these are the things that I always end up doing. Uh, the right things I want to do, but I don't end up doing those. So why, church, is it such a struggle for all of us? Why is it a struggle for all of us to do those right things? The key thought for today, and if you're writing things down, I really want you to write this down. What you feed grows and what you starve dies. Think about that for a minute. What you feed grows and what you starve dies. Whatever you feed grows bigger and stronger. It really does. And whatever you starve, church, grows weaker and it eventually dies. It eventually dies. You know, if I feed myself a lot, right, uh, uh, what's going to happen? I'm going to grow. I'm, I'm going to get bigger. If I starve myself, what's going to happen to me? I will die. I'll die. And that's how it works. If you feed your fleshly nature... If you feed your fleshly nature, what happens, your desire to sin will grow. It will continue growing inside of you. And if you starve your fleshly nature, it starts to die. Church, if you feed your spirit, your spirit grows stronger. Your intimacy with God will increase. And the power inside of you to overcome those evil desires that we all struggle with will increase as well. So how do we overcome the wrong desires of the flesh? You know, it's that, it's that idea, right? I don't want to do this, but I do it anyways. How do we overcome that? How can we let the Holy Spirit empower, empower us to get free from the sinful desires that each and every one of us, we always end up giving into, don't we? Well, the very first thing is this. I got two points for you today. The first one is this. We learn to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how you're going to overcome, church. You learn to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, a lot of people think about these things, right? You know, I, you, you hear in church, if you grew up in the church, you don't even have to grow up in the church to hear this. You've heard about the Trinity, right? Now, I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, and, and God the Holy Spirit. 
And, and a lot of times, people, even in the church, kind of gets this confused. You know, I, I understand the God thing, right? I understand who he is. I understand the Jesus thing. He's a, the son of God. And for many people, though, the Holy Spirit, he's confusing to them. When you think about it conceptually, right, it, it, it may be, but the, the Holy Spirit actually, church, is one of the greatest gifts that you and I will ever receive. It's one of the greatest gifts you will ever receive. Because Jesus said this, right, before he went away, before he ascended up into heaven. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, he said, I'm going to send you something better. Remember, the disciples are all there. He was hanging out with them for those three years of ministry. They, were, they saw amazing things. And, you know, the, he said, I'm leaving. He said, I'm leaving. And he said, but I'm going to send you something even better. So imagine those disciples going like, how can it get any better than this? But it's true. He did. He said, I'm going to go away, and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And basically, church, what that is, that is God dwelling within you. That's the Holy Spirit. It's God dwelling within you. So now what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit, the scripture teaches us, he does a lot. I mean, a lot. His job list is very long, right? He convicts us of our sin. You know, you're doing something wrong and you're like, man, I shouldn't have done that. He will convict us of our sin. And there's also, it, what if you're about to do something wrong? You know what he does, church? He kind of sets that little alarm off inside. You're like, warning, warning, don't do that, right? He, he warns you, don't do that, right? So the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit is our comforter too. Do you realize that he comforts us when we are hurting, right? He comforts us. Have you ever been in that situation where you're really upset or, or you're really hurting really bad? You got something major going on in your life and you start praying and then all of a sudden it just kind of comes over. It's kind of like that, ah. That feeling. The Bible calls it the peace that passes all understanding. You, you, you don't really get it. So the, the, the mind can't get it. We don't have the full ability to understand. But that is the Holy Spirit that, that brings us that comfort. It's not goosebumps, church. It's the Holy Spirit comforting you. And the Holy Spirit also counsels us. He counsels us, right? He is called the counselor. He will guide you in all the truth. He will show you what it is that you need to see. The Holy Spirit will guide you like this is the way that you should go. Some of us really struggle with that, don't we? He's telling you like this is the way you should go. And we're like, man, I don't want to go that way though. But the Holy Spirit is telling you this is the way to go right? The Holy Spirit prompts you. He nudges you. He moves you in the direction that's going to please your heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit, church, I want to make sure you really get this this morning. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. It's a he. It's God in the spirit form dwelling inside of each and every one of us. So when you're battling temptation, I want you to know, church, you do not have to do it on your own. You don't have to do it on your own. You have the heavenly power that dwells within you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, do you understand with the help of God in the Spirit inside of you that you can overcome what you would never be able to overcome on your own? You would never be able to do it on your own. So you have the heavenly power that lives within you. And with the help of God in spirit, you can overcome the desires of the flesh that every single one of us have. So we're going to learn to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. And you have to practice that, church. In Romans chapter 8, if you'll flip there with me, in Romans chapter 8, in verse 12, it says this to us. Romans chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. I love that. I love when someone says, Mark, you have no obligation whatsoever. Usually I think the next thought is like, yeah, you're lying. That means there's a catch. You're telling me there's no obligation. That means there's a big obligation. But you understand, there's no obligation. That means you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. There's no obligation. There's no obligation whatsoever for you to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. So you think like, 
So many of us, we think like, man, I got to do that. No, you don't. You don't. You absolutely don't have to do that. There is no obligation for you to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. But check out what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 13. It goes on to say this. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. And that's harsh. It says, but if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So it says there, it says if you live by its dictates, you will die. It's kind of a little dramatic, right, on the part of the Apostle Paul. It's dramatic. Remember when your parents would be telling you something, you're like, all right, you're being like ridiculous. You're being dramatic. Jacob tells me all the time, he said, Mark, you're always so dramatic about what the consequences are going to be if I do something wrong. Right? I remember growing up, my mom used to, to tell us all the time, there was two things that was always going to happen if you did something wrong. You were going to die or you were going to go to jail, one or the other. <laughs> always. She's like, you're going to go to jail. You kids are going to go to jail. We used to ask her, like, how many times have you been there? You know a lot about that, right? <laughs> but it's true. She was trying to tell us there's consequences to our actions, There's consequences to all of it. And so the Apostle Paul, it might sound a little bit dramatic. And and you mean, what do you mean I'm going to die? How many of you agree, church, this morning? Think about this. How many of you agree that sin can be fun? Raise your hand, seriously, that sin can be fun. For all those of you that didn't raise your hand, you're lying in church. (laughs) You are. I I hope the Lord doesn't handle you right here. You're lying. It can be fun. Sin can be fun for a little while, just for a little while, right? And and listen to me, sin can be fun for a little while, but what's going to happen is going to mess you up. It will mess you up. It really does. I heard a guy, he put it this way, sin thrills and then it kills. And it's very true. It's exciting for a moment, but then it messes you up. You know, you might say like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Man, I hear teenagers say this stuff all the time. Oh, that's not that big of a deal. I could be doing a lot worse. Well, it might not be that big of a deal when it starts, but church, sin grows. It, It grows, right? It grows. It grows especially when you don't confess it. And eventually, what it does is it kills. Think about it. Think what all sin can kill, man. Sin will kill marriages, right? Sin can kill marriages. Sin can kill intimacy with your children, right? You can't have a good relationship with them because of sin. Sin can kill intimacy with our heavenly father. You know, sin can also kill your testimony, church. It'll really wipe out your testimony. Sin can kill your finances, and sin can kill your ability to have credibility in the eyes of the people around you. So sin kills. It really does. It kills. And if you live by what the sinful nature dictates, Paul says, you're going to die. It's going to kill you. I want to read that to you again now that you've got a little bit of background. Verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. You're going to live, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can live. Notice, church, this isn't on your own. This is not your own. You're you're not strong enough to do that. I see a lot of people like, oh, I got this. I know what I'm doing. No, you don't. You ain't got no clue. Anytime someone tells you they know what they're doing, nine times out of ten, it means they don't. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God's divine power, the spirit that resides in every single believer of Jesus Christ, you put to death to the deeds of your sinful nature. It means you got an option there. You got a choice. So what does that mean? It means, church, that you're starving it. It means you're going to starve it out. You're going to stay away. You know, remember what you starve dies. That's exactly how it works. But through the power of the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. And the Bible says you will live. And some of you today, you will decide. Think about this. You have a choice. You have an option. You are under no obligation, the Bible says, to feed into that. So some of you today, you're going to decide to tap in to the power of the Holy Spirit, to overcome whatever it is that you've got going on in your life. 
You'll decide to do that. You will decide to put to death that which is slowly killing you. That temptation, that struggle that you have, you're going to decide today, I'm going to put that to death. Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they, they have this prayer that they recite. And it's really good, but they're missing a couple of things in it. But I want to kind of share some of this with you. Basically, what they're saying is they said, we admit that we are powerless over alcohol. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous says. We admit that we are powerless over alcohol. You know, our lives have become unmanageable. <clears throat> And we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore our sanity. That's what they say. Now, see, they don't get specific, but who is that power that is greater than ourselves? They, they must just not know it yet. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's who it is, right? For a Jesus follower, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. So I want to encourage you today, church, every single one of you, to let the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you let today be the day that you begin healing from your struggle. And here's what it is, is when you admit that you are powerless over something. When you admit that you are powerless over something and that you need a power greater than what you have, the abilities that you have to overcome. So you let the power of the Holy Spirit help you to be whole and to be healed. That's what it takes. So here's a version of that prayer that we can use. I believe I am powerless over blank. What I want you to do this morning, church, is you fill that in. If you're taking notes, I want you to write it down. If you've got a nosy neighbor sitting beside you, you don't want them to know what you wrote down, where your struggle is, you just write it down later. But I want you to think about this, right? You know, I am powerless over blank. And I believe that the power of the Spirit of God will heal me and make me whole. So think about it. What is it for you? I am powerless over blank. We all have our struggles. Every single person sitting in here right now, you are powerless over something in your life. It's that temptation that always reels you in. It holds you back from the life that God has called you to. And so you have to admit, I am powerless over what? It's different for everybody. Maybe you admit, I am powerless over food. Or I admit that I'm powerless over materialism. I admit that I'm powerless over worry. I'm obsessed with worry. Maybe you admit, I admit I am powerless over sexual addictions. You know, I am powerless over the addiction to substances. I am powerless over the addiction to attention. You call it whatever you want to call it, church. But I'm powerless over blank. What is it for you? I want you to really get something today. In this part right here, think about this. You are only as strong as you are honest. You are only as strong as you are honest. Isn't it amazing how we can try to fool ourselves? I mean, sometimes we're not even honest with ourselves, are we? We're not even honest with ourselves, so you're only as strong as you are honest. That means you've got to admit it. You've got to admit, I've got a struggle. I have a problem. I am powerless, right? I am powerless maybe over the lust that I have. Maybe it's powerless for you. It's dope. Maybe some of you, it's pot. Maybe some of you, it's alcohol. Maybe it's meth. Maybe it's dip. Maybe it's pain medication. It's not even yours, and you're taking it. What is it for you? I am powerless over what? Church, here's how it works. We have to confess it. You have to admit it and you have to confess it because here's what happened. Sin grows best in the dark. When you keep it hidden away, it grows best in the dark. And so we confess it to God. That's where you take it first. You confess it to God first, right? And then we come together as people in a Christian community we do. We come together in a Christian community, and so we're called, the Bible says this, we confess our sins to one another. You find someone you can trust, and listen, church, every one of you should be trustworthy in this. You don't run around telling people's business. If someone trusts you with something, and don't you dare use that, hey, I want you to pray for so-and-so because she is, no. They're asking you specifically. You don't share it with someone else. If, let that person share it with someone else. But we are a body of believers, and if someone comes to you and wants to confess something to you and say, man, I need you to pray for me, it's not your job to run and tell the rest of the people. That's called gossip. And we'll shut it down. I promise you, test me in that, okay? <laughs> We've done it before here. 
You confess your sins to one another. You pray for each other. And church, that's where your healing is going to come from. You confess it to God, and then you confess it to one another. You have to think about it, church. Think about this for a minute. You have to be really honest with yourself. You have to recognize where it is you struggle. Do you realize that God can transform your mind? God will transform your mind, right? God can heal you. Man, God can give you the desire for purity. He really and truly can give you the desire for purity. But listen, what remains uncovered will not heal. It won't heal. We have to admit, church, that we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We have to admit it, that we need the help of the Holy Spirit. See, we learn to depend on the Spirit who strengthens us, who comforts us, who convicts us, who encourages us, who counsels us, and he guides us. He guides us into all truth. That's what he does. So you depend on the power of the Holy Spirit is the first thing. And the second point I want to give you today is this, church. You follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We will depend on the power, right, and depend on the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, if you want to flip over to that with me, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 and 25, it says this, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. The Bible says that they have been crucified, church. I'm talking about the flesh and the passions and the desires that we struggle with. They're crucified. They're starving it, right? They're putting it to death. That's what that means. And they're staying away from it. So that power becomes weaker in their life. So they're crucifying these sinful desires. And listen, church, since we live by the Spirit, let us stay in step with the Spirit. So you follow the Spirit's leading. Follow the Spirit's leading, right? And, and how do we keep in step? How do we keep in step? How do we follow the Spirit's leading? We follow the Spirit of God, and here's how you do it, church. You spend time with Him. You do. That way you recognize Him. How many of you have talked to somebody on the phone before? Like, you'll just talk to them on the phone, and, and when you meet them in person, you're like, oh, man, I, I didn't think that's what you'd look like, Right? Good, bad, or ugly, whatever you want to call it, right? You, you, don't, you, you don't recognize them because you only saw a little piece of them. You only heard a little bit of them. You don't recognize them because you don't fully know who they are. And do you realize, church, when you recognize God for who he is, when you spend time with him, when you really get to know him, you will be prompted like you won't believe. So you spend time with him, church. You get to know him through his word, Right? Church, we listen to him. Over time, church, you will actually be able to recognize his promptings, right? He's leading me. He's prompting me. He's guiding me. And the more mature you are in Christ, the more mature you are, the more you're going to recognize, like, he wants me to go this way. He wants me to go this way. You know what? The more you recognize him, you're going to see that he's calling you to keep your mind off whatever, the more you recognize him, church, and follow him, right, you're going to realize, man, he just gave me a verse. He just gave me a verse, or, 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 or he is leading me to help this person. You know, he's telling me to pray for so-and-so, and literally what you're doing is you're keeping in step with the Spirit, the way that God calls us to in Galatians chapter 5, and when you keep in step with the Spirit, the closer you are to God, here's what happens, is he will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Why? Because you are so full of the things that matter. You're full of the things that truly matter to the heart of God. The more time you spend with him, the more you'll be filled up with him, right? You are not tempted by the emptiness of what doesn't matter. And those struggles, those desires, those temptations, they're empty promises from the enemy. They will not fill you up. You are so full of the presence of God. Church, make sure you hear me on this this morning, for real. Hear me on this. You know, don't for one minute, don't for one minute, I'm not standing up here telling you that I don't sin. I'm not standing up here telling you that I don't struggle with temptation. Every single one of us do. We all do. But I'll tell you what, I've been learning for years to keep in step with the Spirit because this is the closest I've ever been to God in my life. 
And I'll tell you how it comes about. You know, when I got to prepare a sermon, it takes a lot of time spending time in his word, praying, seeking him out, right? I am closer to him because I am relying on him. I'm looking for him. And if you are a Jesus a follower, I want to encourage you to do the same. Do you realize how often God prompts you? Do you realize how often God leads you? I did this last week. Someone, I heard someone say this a couple years ago, and I decided I'd try it last week. Every single time I felt that God prompted me, every single time I felt that God leaded me, you know what I did? I wrote it down. I wrote it down. Because you don't realize how often it happens until you actually can see it right in front of you. And so what I would do, I would write it down. When I felt like the spirit was prompting me, I wrote it down. You should do the same. Take notes, right? Take notes on your phone. Get a little sticky paper, whatever you want to do. You write these things down every single time that you feel the spirit of God is prompting you to do something, to say something, to go a certain direction. You write it down. And here's what will happen, church. Here's what's going to happen. You'll be listening to Caleb in your car, and all of a sudden you're going to be like, man, that song really ministered to me. God's prompting you. Write that down, right? You'll be reading in your daily devotion, and this one verse will come out like, man, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what I needed right now. God's prompting you. There'll be a person that you'll see that, man, everything in you will want to run away from them because they're so annoying. And God's saying, no, you talk to them. And you go up and you have a good 15-minute conversation with them. And let me tell you what, God prompted you. How about this, church? Ask God who you can minister to. I dare you. You pray today, say, Lord, show me who you want me to minister to. I bet you within 15 minutes, he got a list for you. He'll point them out to you. Ask him. Try it, try it out. You ask him. Those are promptings. God is prompting I want to share with you, church, this verse one more time today, and I ask the praise team to come up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 and 14. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except for what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it, church. Church, do you realize that when you are walking according to the Spirit, you will not gratify those sinful desires? And I, really, I want you to get this too today. Remember that you have no obligation whatsoever to give in to those sinful urges that the enemy is placing in front of you. You have that no obligation. You don't have to. You literally have to make a choice to do that. God is faithful, church. You realize he is a God who speaks to us. He is a God who points things out to us. He is a God, church, who is for you. How many of you need to be set free this morning? I want to encourage you to let today be a breakthrough for you. That you took the words that you heard straight from God's word and you're going to put them in the place. You're like, you know what? I need to be set free. How many of you recognize right now that there is a war going on in the flesh against the spirit in your life, in every single one of our lives? And today, listen, there might be someone who's sitting here that you are losing the battle bad. I mean, you are beat up. You are bruised. You are hurting. You are wounded because you keep giving in to this temptation that you've got in your life. I want to tell you something, church. You need help. And you can't do it on your own. You can't. It's, it's impossible. You might have a couple of victories, uh, some battles, but you're not going to win the war. You're not. You will be a casualty because you cannot fight that battle without the help of the Holy Spirit who God himself sent to you to help you to live in your life, to be a part of you, to dwell inside of you, to give you those promptings, to show you that there's a better way. And so this morning, if that is for you, if your heart is convicted, you're like, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of losing the battle with this temptation in my life. I want you to know there is a place that you can turn, and that is to your heavenly Father. You admit to him, I am powerless over this. 
And for those of you that don't know Jesus Christ personally, I'm not, you've never given your heart to him. You've never given your life to him. You've never admitted that you are a sinner. You never admitted that you were wrong, that you are struggling, that you are hurting, that there is a big trail of tears behind you in your life because of the you giving into your temptations. I want to tell you, let today be the day that you become equipped with what it is that God has promised you. And it comes from giving your heart to Jesus. So if that's for you, you come forward. There'll be people up here to pray with you. And for the rest of you believers who are here today, whatever that thing is that you got in your life that you are powerless over, let today be the day where you say, I'm done with that. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give you victory in your life. I'm talking about being transformed. I'm talking about being made new. I'm talking about that everything about you will be different because you realize that I can't do it by myself. So how about it, church? Let's stand together and let's sing. But I want to encourage you to respond this morning.